Hey there, it's Jackie from 40 Thrive. Have you taken our listener survey yet? We want to hear from you. As we plan out 2021 on the podcast, we want to hear all of it. Your likes, dislikes, hopes, wishes, dreams. So check out the show notes of this episode for the link. It should take no more than five minutes and will help us create the most powerful podcast possible. Say that five times fast. You're listening to the 40 Thrive Podcast, the show created for women 40 and beyond, ready to shake things up. And now, your host, Jackie McDougall. Welcome back to another episode of 40 Thrive. Today, you're in for a real treat. Melody Murray is back. If you don't remember Melody, she was my guest for episode 54 entitled, A Lesson in Blowing Up Your Life. Melody is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a private practice, and she also works as a mental health evaluator in the ER at Seattle Children's Hospital. She is a, quote, solution-focused clinician with a direct, casual, yet interactive approach. That is a fact. In this episode, Melody shares her brilliance with members of the 40 Thrive community, answers their questions, and inspires us all to reframe, that's a term you're going to be taking home with you, in a way that will bring more peace, understanding, and sanity to our lives. Melody is also the very first guest of the 40 Thrive Live series. Each month, we record one episode along with our 40 Thrive community members and podcast supporters. It's super simple. Support 40 Thrive on Patreon at just the $3 level, and you're invited to be part of something really special. There's a link right here in the show notes. Today's episode is part of what we recorded that day. It was so incredible to have our supporters right there while we recorded the podcast episode, and each Thriver had an opportunity to engage. You could just use the text chat if you want, or if you're inspired, you could come on and ask questions. No one is put in the hot seat without their permission. It's really just an awesome opportunity to be part of this once a month event. So good. So take a listen for yourself. Again, I'll link to the Patreon page. If you'd like to be part of the next one, visit 40thrive.com forward slash episode 91 for all the details. Finally, Melody and I are co-hosting a special 40 Thrive workshop called Who Are You? We dive into our family of origin, which will help us begin to understand how we are, who we are. This workshop will help us explore the nature versus nurture theories of who we become and why. Are we the sum of all of our intentions and choices? Or are we destined to stay a certain way because of the choices made by the people who raised us? In this workshop, you'll get tools to help the real you bust through and come out on the other side of reinvention. So please join us. It's happening February 21st at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. The link is here in the show notes. There is an early bird discount if you register through January 31st. So check that out right here at 40thrive.com forward slash episode 91. I cannot wait to see you there. All right, let's get into today's episode. This month's 40 Thrive Live with Melody Murray. Melody Murray, welcome to 40 Thrive. Thank you. Thank you. I love being here. Oh my goodness. You know, you blew the place up the last time. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way, I hope. Oh, in such a good way. And in fact, the episode was called A Lesson in Blowing Up Your Life because I think there's so many of us over 40, over 50, we're not sure if we just need to make some small changes or we need to blow this shit up. So, yeah. <laughs> And speaking of blowing this shit up, there is no better time for us to have a therapist in our back pocket. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. What is going on with the women specifically that you're talking to? I think everyone being able to take this collective pause has been a good thing overall because it's causing us all to really sit and look at ourselves, look at our lives, look at our relationships, our choices, our children, our partners, and think Am I doing what serves me? Am I happy? Am I content? Do I want more? What does that more look like? You know, we could take what's happened over the last year in a very negative way because it's been devastating. Financial insecurity, homelessness, all of politics. I mean, it's been really, really hard, but we can always reframe things, which is one of my favorite things is taking something that could be seen on the outside as negative, but flipping it in a way that's positive, that serves you. 
And that's what I've tried to do. Like from the very beginning, I'm one of those strange people in the very beginning, whenever this happened, in addition to being a private practice therapist, I also work in a hospital emergency room. Mm -hmm. So front lines all the way. And I remember being in the ER as everybody was talking about what we could do, because even in the medical field in a hospital, we had no idea how big this was going to be. Right. And our bosses were like, oh, we can just take PTO for a couple of weeks. We'll all be fine. Like this is a registered nurse. No one knew what this was going to be. What's PTO? Personal time off. Okay. Thank Personal you. time. <laughs> and because we, because at that time, everybody was assuming that this was going to blow over in a couple of weeks. Right. And we're still in it. We're in the thick of it. I think it's harder now than it ever was. But I remember having this moment and thinking, I mean, as a black woman in America, it's always hard. It just, it's just more difficult. But I think that no one really notices things are going wrong until we're uncomfortable. And I say this all the time to my clients, nobody goes to the gym until their pants are too tight. A lot of times we have to be uncomfortable to motivate us to do something else. And so I remember saying, I hope this doesn't end too quickly because whatever changes people could make, whatever introspective, whatever epiphanies that came for things to change, we have to be able to just marinate it in it for a while and see what we can do differently. If not, we run the risk of jumping back on the exact same hamster wheel and it's going to be the exact same crap over and over and over if we don't change something. And so I was figuring this could be a change for the better for a lot of people. Yeah. And so I do want to talk about reframing because I'm like, please teach us fearless one, like teach us how to reframe. But I want to touch upon something you said. As a black woman in America and a therapist, you get people's problems dumped all day, every day. And I can't imagine as a white woman in America, what you're going through personally. How are you able to sort of process that and do your job without breaking? Hmm. I'm wondering, I'm asking myself that exact same question. You know, I go to my own therapist yeah. and a lot of therapists go to therapists because it's not therapists aren't perfect. Therapists just have just learned some tools to be healthier and we just want to pass that on. And so I go to my own therapist and talk through what's going on with me. And I listen with an ear that I know she has my best interest at heart. I have set a lot of boundaries around my mm-hmm. time. I do not have alerts on my phone telling me what's happening in the news. I don't even watch the news anymore. Everything that we need to know will come to us. And I've decided not to purposely bring certain things in because I can get saturated very easily because I am hearing people's stories all day, every day. And I think that's a really important thing. It's just we talk about diet and being mindful of your diet. And we always think that is just connected to food that we eat. But our diet are the conversations that we have and the entertainment that we watch and that we listen to. We have to be mindful of all the stuff that we're bringing into our environment. And so I just limit it. I limit the conversations I have with people like some of my this is going to sound strange, but literally some of my best girlfriends are white women. And one of my girlfriends, she just moved to a city in Vermont, very, very small town, mostly white town. Mm-hmm. And she just moved into healthcare. She also was a producer, moved into healthcare. And she was talking about the disparities in race with who gets the best service. And she's talking to this conversation as we need to stop this right now. Why? This is just so horrible. And I knew I could talk to you about it. I said, but you need to talk about this with somebody that is, this is new information. I don't need to process this with you. You need to have a conversation with someone else who will be just as enthusiastic and angry and then turn that anger into action. But I've been living this my entire life. I've had to set those boundaries with a lot of my friends because they don't have places to put this. And I do. And like early on, I was on a group Zoom where it was like a bunch of our girlfriends were going to start like doing this happy hour. Let's get together. I did it one time and cut it. And they're like, why? Why not? Why don't you want to do this? I'm like, I am staring at a computer screen all day. I'm talking about the shit in the world all day. I'm not going to do that in my own personal time. Right. It's not doing it. And I think that's the thing. It's just creating boundaries on what you're going to let in. But I know anxiety that makes that difficult for a lot of people because they want to be in the know. But we will be in the know. You're going to always know what the hell to expect. Yeah. Number one, you're not getting an unbiased opinion. I don't care what you're listening to. Reading newspapers or watching TV, listening to radio, for the most part, I would say they all have some sort of agenda. So there is no, I'm just going to get informed because you're not being informed. Mm -hmm. Unless you're willing to listen to all of the places and then it's just taking over your life. So the thought of that makes me want to vomit. Yeah, 100%. In creating these boundaries, what other things are you doing instead? You know, I know I'm walking my dog a whole lot more than she wants me to. (laughs) Is that possible? 
gosh. Yeah, she, you know, she has these moments. She looks at me. She's like, lady, please. <laughs> But just being out in fresh air helps me clear my mind because I think environmental changes does a lot for our psyche. So even if you move from the living room to the kitchen, the kitchen to the bathroom, just sometimes if you're in a distressed by world, just moving your environment can make a big difference. So I go outside and I walk around. I meditate where I'll just kind of just sit and quietly just breathe Mm -hmm. and watch stupid TV. I watch a lot of stupid TV. I just started rewatching Schitt's Creek. So just having a a really silly place to put my energy into, because I love human interaction, but I just don't want to be overwhelmed with all the stuff. Yeah, I have completed Schitt's Creek three times, the entire from top to bottom. (laughs) It is the best. It's the best. It really is. I mean, if there's anything that has come out of that and Ted Lasso, I don't know if you've watched that, but like talk about TV that just makes you happy, that that gives you hope. (laughs) Those are the two if you haven't watched them yet. Oh, and Bridgerton. Who's watched Bridgerton? Oh, my God. Raise hands if you've watched. Uh, my goodness. I was all like, oh, I'm, I, I don't like period pieces, first of all. I'm just going to put that out there. Same. I'm like, oh, all of those books, they feel very hallmark to me. And I'm just, I'm out, no pass. But for some reason, I thought, oh, I'll give it a try. And I was watching it openly in my house until suddenly I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I discovered very, very quickly. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> that, like, oh, my. It was very much like clutching <laughs> pearls moments towards those last few episodes. I was there for that. That man yeah. has... Whew, Yeah. I mean, this is a total sidebar, but I think that we all need um, something to, you know, give us hope and make us feel good. And the rumors that like people want him to be the next James Bond, I'm like, I am so in for that. (laughs) He could do anything. He could do anything. And I'd be right there. Seriously, he could just read my to do list and I would be a okay. Right. Dance in a ditch. I'd be front row. (laughs) All right. So so we know that it's chaos going on in the world, but I think there's a lot of chaos going on within us women over 40, wanting change, feeling the shift like you're talking about, having to really look at our lives, what we've been doing, what's working, what's not working. But here's the thing. Normally, it would be so easy. I shouldn't say easy, but there'd be more opportunity to make some of these changes because you could go out and do things. Mm -hmm. So how do you recommend someone sort of seize the day and this time when there's so much against us? There's so much adversity still. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a big fan of forums like this where people can talk and get mentorship because I I think a lot of times whenever we're thinking of doing anything differently, it kind of just stays in our head and we don't communicate it with people. And sometimes it's hard to communicate with people that are the closest to us because it could affect them. Mm. So, you know, anytime you have the opportunity to reach out to other people and just get sounding boards, there's a ton of Facebook groups out there right now that you can be in and other people in your circle aren't in. 40 Thrive. 40 Thrive is one. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's necessary to look at ourselves. I think we should be doing this every once in a while. We should be doing this. And typically we do it at the end of every year where you look at the year behind us. What did we do and accomplish? What do we want to do in this next year? And I think that we spent a whole year doing that. All of 2020, I think most people were doing that. And so I'm all about paying attention to what your body is telling you. If your body is telling you that you're tired, then you're tired. Slow down. If you're tense around a certain person or around a certain subject, pay attention to that. Your body is talking to you. So just honoring those natural things that come up and looking at it, give yourself the space and the time to just look at and feel what's going on. Because I think, you know, we are our best indicators that things need to change. Right. And so there are people in our lives, there are people that are quarantined in bad marriages, in uh, family of origin, which we're going to get into in a little bit family members that maybe they would have a break from that in the best case, we all need a break from. Mm -hmm. But in the worst case, it's actually toxic. So how do you just reframe that when it feels so heavy? You know, and and it's a difficult thing to do. I'm not saying that reframing is easy. It's difficult, but it's necessary if you don't want to be mired in the negativity of a situation and stay on a pessimistic track. Reframing, in essence, is taking a situation, looking at it, and instead of focusing on what's obviously not good, obviously negative, and switching it in a way that you can see it as a positive thing in your world. It's not saying, oh, I'm so grateful that I got fired. It's not saying that, but you could say, okay, I got fired. Now I've got time to really think about what it is that I want to do and where I want to spend my time. You could dwell on all that didn't go well. Yes, you absolutely could, 
but you don't have to, because that could send you into this whole depression cycle or spiral that is really, really difficult to get out of. So I think it's acknowledging the truth of a situation and then going, okay, here we go. All right. So what are we going to do differently? What can I switch up? One of my clients, there's multiple generations under the same roof. My client, her sister, her parents, and then grandmother. And grandmother just died a week and a half ago. Hmm. And and she'd known that grandma was going to die. And she told her grandmother, as, as grandma was just kind of holding on, grandma, just let it go. It's okay to just let go. And I said, did you really say that to your grandmother? And she's like, yeah, I said it. I, you know, I said it in her ear that it's okay. We're going to be okay. We're going to be fine. And she was sad that her grandmother left for obvious reasons. But then she thought there's so many changes that are happening in her family that she's grateful that her grandmother doesn't have to be a part of the drama, that grandmother yeah. doesn't have to be so anxious about trying not to get COVID, that grandma can be just, she can be released and free and not have to deal with the crap. And then the family doesn't have to struggle to take care of grandma. It's not saying you didn't love grandma. It's just saying, hey, we need to figure out a way that we can see this in a refreshing way so we can move forward. Doesn't mean you didn't love her. But you understand that the change happens and you might as well try to look for what is good out of the change. I mean, it's hell. You know, the homeless population has exploded. Drug use has exploded. Abuse has exploded. Crisis lines are ringing off the hook all over the place. But I think that in a way, the way I reframe that is not the abusive part, but just people are reaching out. They're trying to figure out a way to get help for themselves And I think that there is a way that we can look for what goes well in a situation. I mean, a lot of people have decided, okay, my business isn't considered essential. Okay, who is? New career path. We have a right to decide how we're going to think about everything. And that was told to me by a therapist friend. Hmm. I got some really, really deep news and I wanted her with me as I got this information. And she said, so how do you feel about it? And I said, I don't know yet. And she said, you know, you have a right to decide how you feel about this. That just blew my mind. It just blew my mind. We do in every situation. We have the ability to decide how we're going to think about it, how we're going to integrate it in our lives, how we're going to have it affect us. Right. Now, when you say you can decide how you feel about it, you're not talking about just like blowing past the grief or blowing past the actual emotion that you get from the situation. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean? Yeah, not at all. This typically happens whenever somebody's experienced something traumatic. And let's say you're talking to a family member about this traumatic event that happened to you. And they say, oh, just get over it. I have no idea what you're talking about. (laughs) It's such bullshit. You can't get over anything unless it's been acknowledged in some way, unless you get validated in some way. No one's just going to get over anything. And so, no, I'm not saying to skip over all those natural emotions that you feel the grief in the morning, that's part of the healing process. But we do get to decide how much power these emotions have over our well-being. We do need to grieve. Absolutely. And I talk about mourning, mourning our like lost identity, mourning unmet expectations. In the ER, I talk to parents whose children are in large ways having their first psychiatric emergency. And that's a hard thing to look at. And it, it's a hard thing to take in as a parent that your child may not and most likely will not lead a life that you expected for him or her. Yeah. And that's a hard thing. But there are multiple layers to that grief and opening yourself up to it. But understanding maybe the reframing is I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to grow from this. And so anything similar that comes around, I'll be able to handle it better. And I'll be able to support the people around me that go through it, too. Yeah. Well, Sarita says, yes, this is definitely the time for a contingency plan. And yes, Mm -hmm. just bullshit putting time cap and judgment on grief. I agree with that. Grief is not a straight line, right? She says, unfortunately, we are not all recognizing that we are all grieving. I got to sit with that for a second. That totally just like gut punched me that we are all in our different stages of grief. We are all in a state of grief. We are seeing things and people that we didn't know was there. We're seeing things in family members and coworkers and companies and country, things that we did not want to believe existed, thoughts that we didn't want people to have. And there's a grief that comes along with that. 
a big grief where it's like, I love you and I respect you, but you believe this way that is so different than the way I see the world. How the hell do I reconcile that? Yeah. It's hard. And so there's a grieving period that goes on. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that the anger that you feel about having differences with somebody that's close to you, it's grief more than anything. Yeah. I mean, yes, you're angry, but what's underneath that anger is disappointment. It's shock. It's sadness. It looks like anger. Absolutely. But more than anything, it's like, how can this person who I believe is this way be this way? And that goes against how I'm built. Yeah. It's a hard thing. I think that we're all trying to do the best that we can. I mean, even with people who think differently than we do, we are all trying to make the best decisions for how we see ourselves in the world. So that's how I kind of try to reframe that situation is we are all doing the best that we can according to us. And if that is a way to drive some type of empathy and compassion as we're interacting with people that are different from us, I think it could work. Just understanding that everyone's doing the best that they can and with the level of coping skills that they have access to or what they were taught at any particular time by any particular caregiver. We are functioning the best that we can at any particular moment. And sometimes you see that some people aren't functioning worth well at all. And that's sad. It's really, really sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the whole family of origin thing, like, Stay to the end because I want to tell you about a workshop that Melody and I are running together, which is basically all about family of origin, really figuring out why we are, who we are, all of that good stuff. But we do have a question. Are you open for a question, Melody? All the time. Bring it. All right. Delisa, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, why don't you ask Melody your question? So Melody, my question is um, with my in-laws over the past couple of years with everything going on in the political environment, I have discovered after being married almost 20 years, there's a lot of racially insensitive stuff going on. I have an interracial marriage and I had set a firm boundary to really keep that away from me and COVID actually kind of helped since we're quarantined. But now we have an issue where my husband's grandmother, who was totally different than everyone else and didn't think like everyone else, has passed away yesterday. And I'm trying to figure out whether whether I will attend anything or how to respond to this. Is it, it, Would it be considered petty of me to keep my firm boundary? Because it's violent. It's really, really bad, the things that are posted and said. Or is it keeping me safe and emotionally healthy to just not engage? Mm -hmm. She was great. It's the rest of the family. Mm. So if I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I don't want the flat kind of coming back on my husband. And this is the typical woman thing, like you said, that they're going to give him crap if I don't go. But if I go, I'm not even going to be able to honor her and the person she was because of just the hatefulness that mm -hmm. exists and those that are still left. Mm -hmm. hmm. If you decide not to go, you can create your own way of connecting to her and honoring her. You being in a room full of hateful people, that says nothing about your relationship with her. You can decide to do your own separate kind of memorial for her in any way that you decide works for the relationship the two of you had. I'm not into doing things because it looks good. And I'm assuming if they're going to talk shit about your husband, about you not being there, they talk to his shit about him, about you being there. A lot of people who talk shit just talk shit. You know, they're going to always find something to be angry about. And you can't please those people. So don't even try. Please yourself. And you and your husband talk about it and decide what's going to work best for the two of you. But just letting him know that, you know, however you feel in that space, I think it's a horrible thing to feel vulnerable. I mean, at a funeral, we are vulnerable. Memorials, funerals, we are vulnerable. And then to know that you're in this vulnerable state, in a vulnerable place with people who have not respected you before, that's heavy. That's a heavy burden to bear. So think through as to, you know, what would work for you and what wouldn't work for you and stick to it. And just trust yourself. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I have a question from one of our audience members. She says, when you do have a friend who has shown up so differently in this time, when you feel your values are so different, the friendship feels hurtful now. How do you reconcile that? You know, I don't know if you can. A lot of people have been doing that. We can agree to disagree. Bullshit. We can agree to disagree about pizza toppings. We cannot agree to disagree about certain things in life because your way of thinking directly hurts me. 
it absolutely hurts me. And so I think that's a really important thing to think about is what value does the relationship have in your world? If you feel that there was a connection and there's a closeness and a mutual respect, you know, can you have a conversation? But if you feel that any type of conversation, it, it's just not going to work in your favor, then you need to think, is this person truly a friend? I faced this big time. I grew up in a small Texas town and I have deleted more than half the people I graduated high school with because they've all come out with a certain way of thinking that in their eyes, I am an exception to how they feel about everybody else. And I, I'm just blown away by it. But more than anything, I'm hurt by it. Hurt, hurt, hurt by it. And you just have to realize, like, how much of a true connection do we actually have? If you are not willing to see how I see the world and how the world sees me, and you're not willing to open your mind and have a conversation about it or challenge yourself to think about things differently, then are we as tight as I think we are? We may not be. And not everybody in life needs to be your best friend. Because sometimes we have these situations where we are completely opposite from somebody else, but we still have to be civil with each other because we're coworkers or because we are neighbors. You know, not everybody needs to be your best friend. And not everybody needs to know exactly what's on your mind and how you feel about certain things. There's a fine line between coexisting and being in each other's space and having ideas, maybe different ideas about how the world should work. How do we reconcile when somebody's just like, hey, they think differently than we do, or their ideas are just super dangerous and like, mm -hmm. we have to cut off? Like, do, do you have a, is there a flow chart you can give us? Is there, <laughs> <laughs> do I, I should create one. I should create some type of decision tree. I don't know. It, it's such a personal thing. And there's no cut and dry way of doing this because these are really personal connections. If it's on your mind, this is a personal connection. You really have to think it through. I just kind of feel like, how long has it been since we've had a conversation? Do we ha hang out and have cocktails? I had to literally cut off one of my best friends since I was 12 years old. I was the godmother of her two children. I was at the hospital when they were both born. But she has become a person that just blows my mind. But I know the backstory. I know why she's this person. And it doesn't excuse it. Just because you know why someone's an asshole does not give them a right to be an asshole. And I know where it's coming from, but I had to, for my own sake, I had to disconnect myself from that relationship because it was hurtful to me. It was really hurtful to me. It's a hard thing. And, and I do believe that we can have some level of flexibility in, in what we do, but I'm still a big fan of however you feel in your gut, you can make a decision to protect yourself from other people. I'm not about playing nice just so that everybody else feels comfortable. When I say not everybody needs to know what's on your mind, I'm saying that you can bank a whole lot of information and just be in the midst of a situation and you know how to interact with people based on the things they say or they do. They don't necessarily have to know that you guys see things, the whole world differently, unless that is something that is between the two of you. Like that type of situation is something you, you actually have to confront because we have to do this in the office all the time with coworkers. You're not on the same page about everything. You don't have to be, but you do have to work together. And so maybe just in your own mind, you decide to create that boundary. I had to verbalize with one of my hospital coworkers we do not think the same. And I had to say it in a couple of different ways because he thought we were old buddies and we could hang out. No, I don't respect you. And here are the reasons why. But we still see each other every single week. We still see each other. And, you know, it's, hey, how you doing? It's that whole thing. He knows how I feel about him. And I know what's on his mind. Yeah. We're not going to a barbecue together. Yeah. But I don't have to be in that angry space all the time either. That's where the challenge is, I think, because there are people that you just can't get away from. We're going to talk in just a second about family of origin, but I just want to go to Sarita's other comment here, talking about how you can't agree to disagree about heart issues. Actually, Sarita, if you're open to it, I'd like you to unmute because she talks about when people say to her as a black woman, quote unquote, I don't think of you as black. Are you open, Sarita, to unmute and, and to discuss this? I'm open, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> Have at it. And it's meant to be a compliment. That's what's so fucked up about it. It's meant to be a compliment. Melody, that's what I was going to say. I'm sure you know and have heard that. Because I've been here since I was like 10 or 12 years old when someone would say something that was racist or prejudiced or just outright ignorant. And I call them on it. They're like, well, no, 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 no. We don't think of you like that. And I'm, And the first time I heard it, I was so confused. Like, what do you mean you don't think of me like that? And they're like, you know. And I was like, no. Do you mean black? Because I am all the time 
Like it's the most shittiest thing to say to someone. And the sad part is they're oblivious to the fact that it's ignorant and it's offensive. It's just like the, oh, you articulate yourself. Well, it's that same kind of, you already know. It's the same shit. It's like, what does that mean? Is That means that black people cannot articulate themselves. They, they're not eloquent. But I hear it all the time. And I've had to do the same thing that you did. I had to separate and set a lot of boundaries with myself, with not just friends and family, but also with other Black people. Because, you know, we did the happy hour thing and I am Black all the time. And there is just sometimes I cannot engage in conversations that are constantly talking about the stuff that's going on because I'm aware of it. I'm processing it. And it's it's just sometimes too fucking much. And that is one of the challenges of being not only Black, but being a Black woman, because we we take on the brunt of a lot of things in our families, in our households. And I'm a coach also. It's just a lot of shit, Jackie. (laughs) Yeah. Melody, you have some response to that? Yeah. (laughs) I've heard all the same things, too, growing up. It's annoying as hell. Sarita, you bring up a really good point. And, And Jackie, you brought it up at the very beginning. It's like, how do I handle my stuff when I'm handling other people's stuff? It's picking and choosing where you want to spend your energy. Not every mountain is a mountain you need to die on. We don't all have to be involved in every single conversation all the time. Sometimes we've got the energy in for it and sometimes we don't and we don't have to have it. And I think that's a really important thing to think too. What I was saying all last year and I've started this year with it, I've never shrugged more in my entire life as I have in the last year. Shrug. I hear things that are happening around me with family or friends and I'm just like, this is something that I've incorporated in my therapy. Buddy of mine who grew up with a bunch of friends in a, a friend group. And there's one guy in that group that is just a two of them that are just drama, drama kings. And there's always something crazy going on with them. And so when I talk to him, I always ask him about these friends. And I say, so whenever they tell him about the latest drama that they've been in, I said, what do you say? How do you respond to that? And he said, I just say, Wow. <laughs> That's all you got. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> what? He goes, I just say, wow. Because <laughs> wow means I'm listening to you. I understand and I validate this is a big deal, but I'm not going to ask you a follow up question because I really don't give a shit. Hmm. So find your wow. Find your wow. I even say to some people, like, because we've got a lot of ladies here, I need to change my tampon. You got to get out of a conversation with people. I got to change my tampon. Sorry. All right. These women are over 40. We don't all have that, Melody. I'm I'm, I'm close. I'm I'm going to just start carrying them anyway. (laughs) Tampon. That's hilarious. But you're absolutely right. We don't have to take on all of it. I think that's freeing in a way. The shrug or the wow. You're acknowledging what's being said to you, but you don't have to. You don't have to take it in. Yeah. I think that's that's hugely powerful. Sarita, thank you so much. I'm going to pull up another question. Does it make sense to give up relationships with siblings or family of origin? I love my brother and sister, but I cannot have an authentic conversation with them and not show the part of me that is disgusted by their beliefs. How do you handle that? Well, that's a big question. And it's a very personal thing. I mean, as a therapist, I can't tell people what to do with their worlds because you're the one who ultimately has to live with it. And you know the levels of the relationship dynamics that you have with each and every person. So it's a personal decision. But I did an exercise several years ago that I think is very helpful. Values. How do you choose to live your life? Let's say you want to pick five or 10 values and really decide what those things mean to you. Authenticity is important to you. You know, maybe it's legacy. Maybe it's ambition. And just every decision you need to make in life, whether it's about family or finances, Think about your values and how does making this decision go in line with your values? Does keeping this connection go along with your sense of family and commitment or does cutting it off say something more and bigger that you need to say about how you see a certain thing? It's a personal thing. And I think it doesn't need to make sense to anybody else but you Mm. because we are the ones that are going to have to deal with the consequences of the rewards of every single decision we make. And so stand firm in it. Other people aren't going to get it. They don't need to. They can make their own decisions. You don't need to convince anybody of anything. If you need to protect yourself in a situation and you don't feel comfortable telling them all why, you don't have to. Because a part of the reason why you may not feel comfortable talking about it is because an environment has been created where that type of conversation gets shut down. And that's information you need in order to make your decisions. 
So I'm saying this from experience. There are certain people in my family that were really important to me that I had to cut off and let go because things that they said or didn't say or things they did and didn't do was a direct damage, indirect damage to me. And I had to do that. I had to do that with my own grandmother, who was my savior in my crazy, tragic childhood. Because there were certain things, and it was her trying to protect herself. There were certain things she just could not admit. Denial was her best friend. And I couldn't sign on to that. But I had to mourn that. And eventually, I came around um, where I realized, how much does this mean to me? And when I say eventually, I'm talking years, where I cut my grandmother off, this woman that I love more than anybody. And then I shifted into this space of compassion building for her. And this is a very personal thing. How did she grow up? What were her resources? What was she taught? She did the best that she could with what she had. And that's how she sees the world. And so I was able to develop a level of compassion for her thinking in that way so that I could just kind of put certain things aside because I missed my relationship with her. You have the ability to change your mind. If you decide to do something based on certain evidence, roll with that. A lot of times I think we get stuck in that. I've made this decision. I've got to see it through. Hmm. Well, no. Anytime you've got a military chief and let's say they're at war, when they get new information, they send the troops in a different direction. They don't stick with a certain plan because that's what I said I'm going to do. We need to all be doing that too. We make decisions with the best information we have at any particular time. And then we get new information. We can make new decisions. We can do a complete 180 on a decision that we made because, hey, now I know something that I didn't know before. Okay. That right there, that is brilliant. It's so simple, but it's brilliant because I think especially many women over 40, we make a choice and then we're like, shoot, I made that choice. I better follow through with it or else I seem like I'm not reliable or I'm not whatever, fill in the blank, right? Mm -hmm. When we get more information, we can change that choice. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Delisa adds, how can you keep these things from triggering shame or guilt from our past trauma, fear of abandonment and people pleasing? That's a great point. Some of these things that are happening today might trigger past things. How do you reconcile that? Well, I think that anytime we have a trigger, it's something that hasn't been processed yet. A trigger, it's a conversation, it's a smell, it's a word, it's just seeing someone. If we're triggered, if we're feeling something, a really st- having a really strong reaction to a situation, that means there's growth there. There's the potential for growth there. That means that there's something that still needs to be worked out, talked through, processed in some way, shape, or form. It's not anybody else's job to tiptoe around your triggers. It's impossible. It's not their job. I believe it's our job to lean into our triggers so they stop being triggers. Triggers don't have to stay forever. They will stay forever if you try to ignore it, because what do we do when we try to ignore shit? Nothing happens. It stays there. So I think leaning into it, and and you can do that in slow, subtle ways of just looking at old pictures or journaling or just giving yourself two minutes a day to think about that thing. And if it's too much, back it off. It's 30 seconds. But every single time we allow ourselves to think and talk about our past experiences, that's healing. Mm. It's healing and it doesn't have to be in a therapy room. That can be your own personal work where you're just, you're pushing yourself just a little bit each day. And the point of that is, is to not to throw yourself back into the pain of any traumatic experience. That's not the point. The point of it is, is to get yourself into that place as you hear similar situations, as you see those people, they don't own you. They don't have power over you anymore because you've looked at the situation from all of the angles. You've taken your personal accountability and then you've also taken out the personal shame and embarrassment that you may have over something that had nothing to do with you. Mm. And you release that on other people. There's a lot of trauma that we've experienced that we internalize and act like it's our fault and it is not. So telling our stories sometimes can be very embarrassing. It can be very scary. But hey, if you were molested, if you were raped, honey, tell that story, scream it from the fucking mountaintops because you survived it. You did not bring that on yourself. I don't care what you were wearing or what you were drinking. You've survived a situation that someone horrible came in and tried to screw you up and you've gotten through it. It may be a little clunky, but you're still alive. And I think that's something to celebrate. And the shame doesn't belong to us. When you've been hurt, look at your part in a situation, but in in situations like that, it doesn't belong to us. When we are in a traumatic experience, we typically do three things. We fight, 
literally fight. Or when it comes to the pandemic, the fight response, I believe, is toilet paper. It's tr- it's hoarding all that stuff. It's a fight response. It's a trauma response, getting all that toilet paper. Um, freeze. And then flight, taking off and running. I think that a lot of times when we're in a horrible experiences and we don't respond in a way that we think is tough, we are mad at ourselves. Why didn't I run? Why didn't I fight? Why didn't I speak up? Why didn't I? Honey, we don't decide. Our brain decides. That's when we go back to our base level as human beings. And we don't have the time to think things through when we're in these split second situations. Our brain goes, run. Our brain goes, stay still. Our brain decides because our brain has decided what is going to get you through the situation in a safe way, the quickest way. The brain decides. So I think that's another way we should let go of any shame that we have towards any situations because we're just trying to get through that moment Mm. and we have to do whatever we can to survive the moment. And if you scream to survive it or run to survive it, or if you stay silent to survive it, that is okay. You're surviving it. Yeah. And sometimes we judge ourselves on what our reaction was then based on who we are now. Mm -hmm. That's not fair. Yeah. And so I know a lot more at 49 than I knew at 39. Mm -hmm. And so why would I expect my 39 year old self to respond to something like my 49 year old self has the ability? It's always the judgment over our feelings, in my opinion, that kills us. Mm -hmm. Because it's like we feel sad, or we feel grief, or we feel angry. But then we start to judge. Why do I feel this way? What's wrong with me? That's where I struggle sometimes is the judgment of the feelings more than just feeling the feelings. All of us handle feelings very differently. We all have a different level of comfortability when it comes to emotions, our own emotions, and then being around people when they're expressing their emotions. And I think that that's a really important thing to realize is that we can't control somebody else's emotional response. So if you have to make a big decision about something, Delisa, I'm thinking about you. You decide you don't want to go to this memorial. Other people are going to be like, you should be there. You've got to be there. You've got to be. I need you there. Well, no, they can handle their own shit. You need to take care of your own emotions because some people don't want to do things on their own. If they feel if they're connected with somebody else, it's going to make it easier for them. But what about you? The judgment that we have over our own emotions and everybody else's, it pisses me off. And I think that's a lot of a generational stuff. You know, we're talking about family of origin. Family of origin is, is where we come from. It's those people that formed us very early on. And obviously it starts off with our primary caregivers, whether it's parents, grandparents, but teachers and community leaders and friends, those people help us see who we are and how we want to be seen in the world. Now, it's helpful in a lot of ways to look at this and figure out how you want to handle certain situations. Because basically we are all handling every single situation based on how these situations were handled by our parents. Whether, you know, we have money issues, it's feast or famine, or we go into hustle mode, or we shut it down and go into denial. All of those responses come from what we saw growing up. And I don't say that in a way for people to think, oh, there's no ability for me to change. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying sometimes that helps you cut yourself a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of slack. I do this because they all did this. But now I'm in a place that they made those decisions based on what they had at the time. I'm in a completely different place. I'm more financially secure than they were. I'm in a safer environment that they were in. So it's time maybe we look at how we handle situations and do them differently to serve who we are right now. And I think you bring up such a really good point, Jackie, and how shaming yourself and thinking, why the hell? I'm 24 years old and I went on a date with that guy. What the hell was I thinking? <laughs> well, you were thinking like a 24-year-old. Right. Cut yourself some slack. You know, you did the best you could back then. I think a beautiful way to look at growth is if a situation were to come up, how would you handle it? How are you handling it right now at this age? And then how did you handle it five years ago, 10 years ago, a month ago? If there's a difference, that's your growth. And you need to applaud that growth and not judge, oh, I was such a dumbass back then. Talk about reframe. That was a, that's a really good, (laughs) that's a powerful reframe. (laughs) I just started with a brand new client this week and she's divorced. She's got two kids and she's in the dating world. She was married for 10 years. She was with her husband for 15 years, got a divorce, was in a relationship after that for seven years knew it wasn't right. Relationship after that was four years. I said, honey, look at it. Like it, the, the time keeps shrinking because she was criticizing herself for it. I'm like, you're realizing faster and faster. What does it work for you? You should be proud of that. And she just, she had, and that's reframing the situation. Instead of feeling bad about it, go, wait a second. You're shrinking the amount of time that you're wasting with people that aren't worth you. Oh, 
reframe it. Yep. I love it. I love it. So I want to talk about the workshop coming up February 21st, same time as our live call today, four o'clock Eastern, one o'clock Pacific. And basically, it's called Who Are You? We dive into your family of origin, which will help us all begin to understand how we are, who we are. My favorite line ever, how we are, who we are. (laughs) Who doesn't want to know that no matter what your background is, right? Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm just bringing you all together. Melody's going to take over and and do this, but you're going to lead us through an exercise that will help us explore nature versus nurture, which is huge. And it goes back to like how people raised in the same family can turn out so... (laughs) very different. Polar opposites. Right. You assume are polar opposites. Yeah. And I love that you re- you had written in the description, are we the sum of all of our intentions and choices or are we destined to stay a certain way because of the choices made by the people who raised us? Oh, that's so good. Those agreements that were made without us. Yep. Right. Right. That we somehow continue that story. So in this workshop, you'll get the tools to help the real you bust through and coming out on the other side of reinvention, which is a really great place to be. So I'm really excited for that. I'm going to put the registration in the show notes and obviously our Facebook group. And I think it's going to be a really powerful time together because not only are you an expert, you have all the education, you have all the fancy letters after your name, Melody, but you also have gone through so much. One of the things, at least when I was younger and going through therapy, you never got personal experience from a therapist. Mm -hmm. You know, I love the shift in this, in that you've been through so much turmoil and trauma, not only surviving it all, but thriving on the other side of it, that Sure, I love your degrees, but it's really what you've done as a human and a woman that really makes me follow everything that you have to say. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> and you know, and that's reframing my childhood. Like I didn't grow up with healthy parents. And so with that, instead of sulking and and you know, being in that space of, oh God, my parents suck, they were assholes, I'm like, wait a minute. But that means I don't have any expectations of who I'm supposed to be. I don't have to fall into some family line. I can do whatever the hell I want. And no matter what I do, it's going to be better than what they did. Wow, that bar is low. That bar is low for you. (laughs) It's low. (laughs) But I think that this workshop will also be equally as powerful for those who grew up in what you would look as an idyllic upbringing, because I think many people can be just as questioning themselves and their purpose and all of that. You don't have to have gone through like what you've gone through specifically. Absolutely not. And I think that's a really important point to make. When I blew up my life, one of the things was getting divorced. And I got divorced from one of the kindest, sweetest, hottest looking people on the planet. We were just heading in the wrong direction. We just, it just wasn't going to work any longer, but we're still the best of friends. But he came from a completely different background. Parents are still together. They got loads of money. Everybody's healthy and happy mentally and physically. And that was just such a foreign thing to me. But yet I, I gravitated towards that because I wanted that security. But they're still in those situations. Sometimes it's a sense of duty that you have to do a certain thing because of the family name. You have to get married and have children because that's what everybody else is doing. But what if you don't want to do that? Allowing yourself to be released from a lot of agreements that our communities make for us, that our cultures make for us, that I have to take care of my parents because they're elderly, but they used to abuse me. I have to have children, but I can't afford it. And it's just not my jam. I have to do this. and I have to, I have to go to college. We don't have to do a damn thing. We need to do what feeds our souls or we're living our lives for other people. And I think that's a really important thing to really look at as we're paying attention to where we came from and who we are now. Hold on to those positive, amazing, wonderful, fun things and know that there is a space where you can put all the dysfunctional stuff, the unhealthy stuff and not hate on it. Or And you don't want to be pointing fingers or shaming other people, but you don't have to take that on and you don't have to take on other people's stuff in order to make the best decisions for your own personal life. Right. That's amazing. I love it. And I cannot wait to do this workshop. If you're interested, go to the show notes and register. If you're on this call live, I can email you that so you get a little sneak peek. Melody, thank you so much. Thank you. I love doing this. How amazing is she? (laughs) Nice to meet you all. Thank you, everybody. I hope that this was fun. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all for supporting 40 Thrive. It means so much to me. You have no idea. And we'll do this again next month. Thank you so much for listening. It has been possible to do this show for two years because of two things. Number one, you subscribe. Thank you. 
When you subscribe to the podcast, you never have to search for it again. You will get every episode. You'll get an alert. You can choose your favorite podcast app. It can be on your iPhone. It can be on your Android. It can be on your tablet. It can be on your home speaker. There are so many places you can subscribe to 40 Thrive so you can get it automatically. So thanks for doing that. I really appreciate it. And number two, I hope you'll consider sharing this podcast because when you share it, not only does it help us be able to continue this and to reach more people, but imagine what it would be like if all of the women in the world over 40 felt their best and were able to stand up and take charge and support each other, right? Imagine it. And so when you share the show, we are one step closer to that. So I really appreciate it. Until next time, take care and keep thriving. Spring has sprung, and with the change of seasons, sometimes comes an increase in vitality. If you're feeling in the mood for a little more personal time, may I suggest Coconut. Coconut is all about providing clean and natural ingredients when you're enjoying your most intimate moments, with or without a partner. Naturally safe products developed by people who are obsessed with quality. Get 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut. That's 15% off with promo code GROWNASS at grownasswoman.guide forward slash coconut.